uh, in parallel, we're gonna have a, a series of ad hoc talk. Um, every month, we're gonna uh, invite uh, one um, um, core team member of Handle Ad Hoc, collaborating with uh, one guest speakers uh, to talk about one uh, topics. Uh, it could be um, uh, relate to um, our cultures or technologies. So this um, um, uh, uh, um, this talk will focus more on the historical and artistic aspect um, that uh, reflect uh, from the work of Jennifer um, and uh, Myla Rosentros. So I will uh, let um, our two speakers uh, talk about their work. Thank you, Chung. So let's now um, move on to looking at um, what our speakers are going to talk about and in terms of our topic for tonight, which is surviving the fantasies of modernization. So it's looking to be a really interesting uh, talk that we are going to have. So first of all, I would like to introduce our first speaker, um, Milo Rosenthal, who is a human rights educator, campaigner and advocate for healthy people and planet development. So the March 8 textile factory was a major site for the Vietnamese Communist Party's efforts in the 1960s and 70s in terms of wanting to manufacture a modern socialist um, society, economy, city and family. So Dr. Myla Rosenthal documented the lives of the, um, the labour and the March 8 women workers in the 1990s and that transitional point where Vietnam was moving from socialism to a market economy and setting a different ideal of what was considered modern. So in the 2000s, the factory was fully um, relegated to history and was closed permanently. So in terms of this, um, Myla will explore what do we want to learn from the arc of this famous factory um, and tell the remarkable story of the women who worked there at the March 8 factory. So um, Myla, I'd like to please hand over to you now so you can discuss um, your research uh, about the factory, the March 8 factory. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, and thanks, Chung. And thank you to Hanoi Ad Hoc for bringing us together today. Uh, this is really a pleasure for me to be here and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. I, uh, it's a pleasure in part because of my own nostalgia for um, the research that I did in the late 90s. So about um, uh, 25 years ago. And um, at the time I was talking to women in many cases who had been the first generation of workers in the, in the factory. Um, so it was about 25 years before that in the 60s and 70s. So I, uh, I think one of, the, um, one of the things I think about when I think about uh, surviving the fantasies of, uh, of the modern is how at each of those stages, we were at a moment of, of what was considered modern and at each of them now we can look back and say, well, that wasn't, that wasn't, uh, that moved on, that things changed and how do we survive is the topic of what I'm gonna talk about today. So um, I'm going to uh, share my screen and um, showing you some uh, images that I hope will um, give you uh, help to give you some more context. Um, Chung, uh, in his introduction about Hanoi Ad Hoc, talked about uh, the role of um, Hanoi Ad Hoc in archiving and theorizing and then in provoking. And, and um, a piece of what I'm talking about today is in fact, is in fact archiving, starting quite literally with a, a photo archive. So this photo is of the March 8th factory. It's sort of at the height of its modernization, of its modern times in the 60s. Uh, fairly early on when it was first built. Um, and uh, this photo is from the archives, the photo archives of the Vietnam News Agency. So it's, a, it's from you know, Vietnam's uh, official um, news service and it is one of, of many, many pictures that I looked at of the factory uh, during the time when I was doing my research. And I think the fact that the factory was so well, that the, the, it was so well documented and that it was publicized so much is again, a sign of how, um, 
how important the factory was in a uh, in the uh, in the history of Vietnam and the history of the 20th century in Vietnam. So this factory, the March 8th textile factory, was one of the first major efforts in uh, um, to create a modern industrial socialist economy in Vietnam, and that's why it was so important um, for the social and political history of Vietnam. I'm going to I'm going to do three things today. I'm going to talk about uh, quite about the history of this factory. This is the, this is a really remarkable story of the socialist vision for the factory. So I'm going to talk uh, about that. Um, and what that idea of the modern was uh, during that period of the socialist vision. I'm gonna talk about what happened to that vision, which is what was going on when I was there doing the research in, in the 90s during the, the time of economic opening and market reforms. And then very briefly at the end, I just wanna sort of look forward uh, to a little bit thinking about the possibility of what that, uh, what the, the new vision for Hanoi and other cities, how, how we can think about what the March 8th textile factory tells us about the future. Um, so this factory, as I said, had this you know, very powerful revolutionary history. And, this, and it was the center of an attempt, um, a, a very powerful attempt by the socialist state to create this new kind of socialist, certainly a socialist economy. It's a state-owned textile factory. It was um, one of the first big industrial developments in Hanoi. Um, so it, a, an idea of creating an urban proletariat. Um, and that uh, it was also an, an idea of um, creating the most, uh, the most modern forms of production. Actually, um, uh, a piece of this, what was modern about this factory at the time was that it had, it brought technology and, and architecture from, uh, from other countries, and so it was primarily from China. Um, the, the design of the factory came from uh, Chinese architects and engineers who came and worked on site to to, um, uh, to design the factory, help set it up. It was Chinese engineers who set up the all of the uh, equipment that's in it, the machinery, and um, uh, and taught. Um, Vietnamese mechanics, how to maintain the machinery, and of course taught Vietnamese workers how to work each of the, the machines in each section of the factory. So, uh, so that was a, one idea of the modern was, was of bringing expertise from other places to, uh, to create this. Um, another another uh, way that, that the importance of this factory was celebrated was um, in bringing Uh, uh, Ho Chi Minh coming um, himself to open the factory. So this was the uh, the day that it was opened um, in 1965. Again, archive photos of uh, Bako's visit. And as you can see, when I talked about the the partnership with the with uh, China, which is very clearly um, shown in the in, in the posters that are hung during while he spoke. Um, he was really warmly applauded. It was very exciting for the workers that he was there. All of the workers I talked to who who had been there in 1965 had been young women in the you know in the very first days of working in the factory. Uh, they all tell stories about this visit. It was it made a huge impression on people um, that it was a sign of how important they were, how important the factory was, and how important the workers were. Uh, that that. Uh, Ho Chi Minh came to visit them personally, that he toured around the sections of the factory. You can see there, uh, he's talking to a worker in the, um, in the spinning section. If you can see behind her, all of those, uh, uh, all of those spools of thread that, that she's working on um, spinning, uh, that, he, that he went around all, all of the sections of the factory and talked to the workers. And that was really, uh, really seen as, as a, as a sign of how important the factory was. And in fact, um, what he said on that day, and again, this is part of the archives, the history of the, the official uh, archival history of the factory. Um, he talked about the, the name of the March 8th factory. It is International Women's Day. Um, and about how that, uh, that importance of working hard and contributing to building socialism was again, part of a, uh, the work in a modern factory 
and that importance of catching up to the textile technology level of the world was very much that idea of, uh, of um, Vietnam kind of entering uh, uh, this very new phase. So how did the how did the party and the factory help to create the modern socialist worker through the factory? Well, um, one of the ways that they did in terms of in terms of work was that um, all of the women who from the first generation of workers uh, in the factory, the women all came from the countryside. So this idea of, of um, creating, uh, again, creating an urban proletariat of bringing young women from the countryside. So they were living very differently. They were, they were you know, in a very different kind of environment than they lived in a, a, at home. Um, and then their training as workers was, was not only about how to, um, how to how to work in the machines in whatever production section in the factory that they were assigned to. Um, so they had a really, there was, there were, there was what is now considered a, you know, a very long training period of two years when women were, were learning to work in the machines and they were, work, they were doing shifts. Um, but they were also, there was also a big part of it was political education. So they were going to a lot of meetings. There were poster campaigns in the factory. There were slogans. There was, uh, Homes. There were there was a lot. There was a there were lots and lots of meetings and discussions about what was uh, what it meant to be a good socialist worker. And so there were there was a lot of importance put on, of course, on productivity. Um, that each worker should work as hard as two people, and then eventually as hard as four people. That the you know that that, that um, working really hard and thinking about innovations of uh, ways to improve the work in the factory. Uh, and being very dedicated and 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 treating work as a kind of central moral obligation was uh, really um, uh, was all part of the creation of the new socialist worker in the factory. And this was um, this was a time of a really great excitement. So the women I talked to who were who. Um, who had been there as in the first generation of workers, uh, all remember this time as being uh, as being of very much of, of of being on the cutting edge of being modern. They were doing something brand new. Um, they were very they were given a lot of uh, a lot of credit for it. They were seen as very important. Literally, these two photos, which are from the Vietnam News Agency archive, they are titled labor heroes. So these are women who are who are you know at work at the factory and they are considered heroes. They're the the, the new socialist workers and the new socialist women. And um, that is important for them. I also just want to point out a couple other things from these photos because um, I'll talk a little bit in a minute about what it was like to actually work in the factory. Again, uh, the photo of the two women standing together, they are they are in the weaving section of the factory. And so what they're holding in their hand are the wooden shuttles that um, run through the looms of the, uh, of the weaving machine. So if you think about the different stages of production in textile and garment production, uh, the, the, there's the producing produ production of the, um, of the thread, which you see the spinning, the spinning of the thread, which is the, uh, all of those spools of thread that the woman is, the worker there is, threading onto the um, these giant spindles and then the thread goes into the weaving section and then it's it's woven into uh, into um, fabric and then that fabric is sent to the dyeing and patterning section where it's cut it, it's it's colored it's uh, and it's cut into uh, into the right size for either selling at that point or going into the garment section which is where it's sewn into clothes so, uh, this also captures, these machines are still the same as they were in the 60s. When I was there in the 90s, these were still, the machines had already been um, disassembled twice and moved out to the countryside during the American war when the factory was being bombed. And so they were, the machines had been taken apart and put back together again, at least twice already. They were, they were um, at the time, they were kind of the, the, when I was doing my research, of course, they were no longer the new, newest machines. They were kind of old technology. Um, but at this at this point they were they were brand new and and um, they were part of this uh, of this 
um, the, you know, just this, these entirely new ways of working in Vietnam. Um, the other, uh, this is another, just, just an example of, a, of another quote of the showing again, how the aim of the factory was to, um, to create, uh, to, to, to start with this new generation, this young generation of, that would um, uh, learn revolutionary knowledge from working in the factory, um, from being part of the political efforts in the factory, um, and also become, uh, become good textile factory workers, which was of course uh, the, yeah, you know, the important point about, um, uh, about the, the, the values of the, of the community. Um, besides learning how to be good socialist workers, uh, the other thing that the workers, the women there were experiencing was um, a very concerted attempt to make them into good socialist women. And that was, um, that was done a lot through the domestic life of the women, who, the workers. So the, uh, the, the young women who moved, who moved from the countryside to work in the factory lived in uh, communal housing that was, uh, it was called a coup a, 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 um, a kind of factory dormitory. And the factory, the dormitory, the coup was designed again, like the factory was designed to be a modern way of, of living. And it was intended to, to really shape the way that women lived very differently from how their mothers had lived and how they had grown up in the countryside. Um, so the whole design of the coup was geared towards the, uh, the values of socialism at the time and these principles. And so this included um, a lot of communal living, the idea that uh, everybody was equal. And so that um, there were communal kitchens and communal dining halls and that workers were expected to cook and eat together and to, and to cook the same things and eat the same things. And during that period of time, that was um, when, uh, the, uh, the state subsidy time during the war after the war, when there, was, when there wasn't a lot of food and there was, um, you know, the, the, uh, and there wasn't a lot of, uh, there weren't a lot of material goods. It was really important for that communal living to kind of, to, to, to show and reinforce that what was important was the way that people lived and worked together and, um, and, uh, 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 and the kind of equality that that socialism uh, re represented and strove for. So there were all of these um, kind of rules about and directives uh, about how to be a, a socialist woman who worked, who lived in this communal living. Um, one of the fundamental ones was to to not carry on feudal values, which is what was seen as you know the way that they had lived in the countryside traditional. Um, Vietnamese ways of working, so that uh, ways of living, so that they were they were away from their families. There was these, were, which was unusual at the time, right? For young women to be living on their own, um, they were expected to be able to uh, choose their own husbands, for example, which was also very different. So moving away from arranged marriages, which were soon seen as feudal, um, it meant they weren't going to be living with their mothers-in-law because they were going to be living in their own spaces, which was a very different. A uh, very different idea for young women, um, and uh, the idea that they were going to they were going to live equally with their husbands that that, that men and women were equal, which was a um, uh, uh, which was a an idea that was reinforced over and over again in the again in the in the meetings in the um, the campaigns in the fact in the in the coup. Um, another thing that was very different about the life in this communal living space was um, that there was uh, that there was supposed to be no what was called uh, superstition, you know, essentially um, kind of spiritual practice and religious practice. It was important that um, that uh, there wouldn't be like wasteful tet celebrations, as it was said, you know, the burning of paper offerings and. Uh, no fortune telling, and one of the ways, again, in the in the space that that was one of the ways that was represented in the space was that in the factory and in the originally in the coup there were no wall altars. There was no um, there were no altars that 
uh, for um, praying to the ancestors. And that was, that was something that, uh, again, a lot of the women remember and talk about as being, you know, uh, a very, a very um, new way of, of living for them and, and made a huge impression. And once things started to change, it was one of the first things that came back was the practice of, um, uh, was spiritual and religious practice. So this is what the, uh, the coup looks like, looked like in the 90s by the time I was doing my research. So uh, it um, was just north of the factory and, um, and all of the workers in the factory who I met, you know, lived in, this, in these communal livings. Um, what they were doing now uh, during the time I was doing my research was essentially uh, about a decade into market reforms the women were, for the most part, uh, moving beyond the I, a lot of those ideals, those socialist principles that the factory and the coup had been built on, and especially in here in in domestic life, you know, this thing that was so important in the design of it, which was the communal kitchens and communal dining, the idea of, of all of this all of this sharing and all of people being equal that had really completely changed by the time that I did my research. So um, people had, the families had kind of separated out the kitchens. Everybody had their own rice cooker and a little, um, a stove usually in front of their front doorway. So that even though these were very small rooms and not big enough to have um, uh, much of a kitchen in them, the families had adapted them so that they were not, they weren't cooking and eating together. They were very much living much more private uh, family lives. And they really adapted the space in order to be able to do that. So despite the architecture of the building and the ways that it was intended to be used, they had adapted to how they wanted to use it themselves. Um, the, uh, the other thing that had changed in uh, the time I was there was actually the work itself in the factory. So um, this, is a, this is again an archival photo. This is from uh, the, uh, the packing section of the factory. So this is after the cloth had been, uh, after the thread had been woven into cloth in the weaving section and then it had gone into the section where it would be dyed if it was dyed in different colors or there were patterns printed on it. Um, and then it was, uh, it came out here in this, uh, this machine which would help to, to iron it out and come out onto these tables where it would be folded and packed up. And at this point, the, uh, the, the fabric could be sold directly or it could go, as I said, to, the, to, the, to be cut up and sewn into clothes so that so the products of the factory could be sold at every stage. Um, this one of the, again, the, the, the points I would make about this archive photo from the 60s is that these machines were still there when I was doing my research in the late 90s. So again, a shift from a time when they would have been, this would have been the most modern form, of, you know, these would have been the most modern machines in, in textile production. Um, but certainly by the time I was there, I, I, I think all of us, um, all of us knew that they were, this was no longer kind of the modern cutting edge of, of production. I'll say one other thing about this, um, uh, about this, the, the ways in which women adapted to the work in the factory. Um, and this I think was, was, uh, was, one of the, was one of my findings about how women adapted to the, the, the demands of work and, and these really, these, these jobs, which were really hard. So the factory worked in three shifts. They had a morning, afternoon, and evening, and overnight shift, which meant women were, you know, women's schedules were changing a lot. Um, and that was that's hard. That's physically hard on on people to um, to have those 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 very shifting schedules where they were sleeping at different times. It was hard on their um, for them planning things with their uh, for their families, take care of their kids. Um, so that was already that was that was already you know a, a challenge for women. Another was uh, the way that they were assigned to different um, production sections in the factory. And so there were some that were seen as there was some there was some of the some of the work was seen as as much harder and worse than others. 
when I showed those pictures earlier of the spinning section and the weaving section, they were not, those were harder sections to work in, in part because they were so noisy. So if you worked in that section, it meant that you did your entire eight hour shift or often you'd be held afterwards and you know do end up with a 10 or 12 hour shift. You spend that whole time um, with all of this noise uh, and um, which was not only hard on your ears, but it also meant that you, you essentially couldn't talk to anyone for during that period of time. And so that was seen as extremely unfriendly um, that, uh, you know, that you had to work in this situation where you couldn't, you couldn't interact with anyone. Um, and one of, so one of the ways that women adapted to that, which they talked about was that in those sections, um, they wouldn't, they, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't bring their own lunch. They wouldn't pack their lunch. They would go to the cafeteria, the canteen to have lunch because it was the one time they could be away from the machines and sit with other women workers and talk. So that period of that lunch break, which I would go to that even though everybody complained about the food um, and said the food wasn't very good, they would say that they wanted, they would go to take those lunch breaks because it was a chance to talk to other women. Um, this section, oh, this section that, I'm, this uh, that I, that this, of this photo um, was actually a very popular place to work because it was, because it was quiet and because you could see um, women were standing in these, in, the, in front of these tables together uh, all day long so they could they could talk and chat and have a little, lot of interaction and this was seen as a much um, a much friendlier section to work in although the work was hard and they were constantly you know folding and carrying things back and forth um, but because they could have they could uh, have a kind of relationship with each other that was seen as a much nicer place to work and um, and, in, and in this section women would generally pack their lunches and sit around together and eat their lunches together rather than going to the canteen because they didn't have, they didn't need that kind of break of being in a different section in order to have quiet um, so uh, uh, that was the that was one of them oh, one oh and one of the other things that struck me about how women use the space again, adapting to the space was that um, after lunch uh, or, you know, whatever the meal break was, we would all, there were always spaces where we could nap in the fact, which was seen as a very valuable thing in the factory. And because of those curves of those machines where the, where the fabric came out, those were, that was kind of an, um, a cozy place to curl up and have a, a, a nap before starting work again. So this was seen as a, a place where the the physical space and the layout of the work was um, uh, was just a much was just a much comfort more comfortable and happier place to work. So this is the um, this is the this is kind of, this is kind of the situation that uh, was prevailing at the time when I was doing my research. This is what it was like in this in this factory dormitory and in this factory. So where women had gone, these workers had gone from being um, the center of a, of a really important political project of the building of state socialism. And now at this time, during the market economy, really were the, uh, that, that was no longer true. That was no longer the modern way to be. And in a market economy, they were just textile workers. So they worked hard. They tried to save enough money to for their kids to go to school. They didn't want their kids to be garment workers. Um, they didn't. Uh, they didn't want to live communally in the coup. They wanted to live in their own little apartments in their own spaces. They wanted to practice um, whatever religion or spiritual practice that they had. They had wall altars. They wanted to go to the pagoda. They wanted to celebrate at Tet. Um, so that they were. So what had been, that was kind of their. I mean, talk about surviving the fantasies of modernization. What had been the fantasy of modernization during the socialist era, they had survived into a new time of uh, of uh, of capitalism and and um, and consumerism, and that was the the world that they were living in. They were they were very aware that they had as um, as they said, kind of been left behind by history. This generation of workers. Um, and they knew that they were that they had gone from uh, a time of working in in the most modern kind of factory to um, to something that was very old fashioned and feeling that um, and and them knowing it was very old fashioned. 
so that is the that is the situation that the women found themselves in. They um, they did know that what a modern factory looked like was something like this. Um, and since I've uh, done that research, I've spent time in factories in places like this, export processing zones um, in Vietnam and around the world. Um, and the uh, it is a it is often a kind of cookie cutter kind of architecture. It's a kind of design. It's hard to imagine adapting this space in the way that the women workers of March eighth adapted their their um, the factory space and the coup space to live in. So I would say that um, actually the in a modern factory that the there are workers who are working um, actually even longer hours though under worse conditions um, that there are more and more workers in these kind of in this in these sort of factories around the world they're producing more stuff for more consumers um, and that we uh, that the values of the idea of the March 8th factory of idea of producing a certain kind of worker and producing a certain kind of woman um, is you know have, are, are really the are really not operating anymore in um, in in uh, in a modern factory. That in fact they're operating according to this much more narrow rules of capitalism, which is about uh, maximizing production. Production is certainly not about any form of of uh, social justice or any form of um, uh, uh, principles or values in that way. So in this in this. In this uh, in this environment, where this is the the kind of modern of industrial production, the um, the March eighth factory is closed. The site will almost certainly um, be redeveloped into something that is not at all industrial, um, probably residential, commercial, um, and it shows again how everything that was modern at one time becomes old fashioned and becomes changed. And so, what I would argue is that. Um, uh, that this shows that we need a new vision of um, of what a modern city is, and that's what the that's one of the things that the March Eighth Factory for me points to. And so, when I talk about um, with a vision for the future, I'd say um, that the you know the vision is that it will look like this. Um, and I show this, this is my city, this is New York City. And this is in, in um, at first glance, this is, you know, this is recent flooding. I, I feel like I could show pictures from cities around the world from the sort of extreme weather events that we've had over the last uh, few months. Um, and this is at, at, at first glance, I, you know, this picture is about the subway, our subways flooding and a kind of, the kind of, uh, destruction that cities are going to face in the planetary emergency that we're facing now, um, that this is the danger of what the modern city could look like. Uh, um, but actually, what's interesting to me about this picture is uh, during this time when there was flooding, this is actually the only subway station that flooded. And there was a, it was a story that was um, specifically about how uh, after a big hurricane about a decade ago, New York City has spent a long time trying to retrofit its its subways by creating new uh, new spaces for the water to run off to and to make them more climate resilient. And that is so. This is actually the only subway station in New York that flooded during the most recent uh, heavy rainfall, and that meant that uh, all the other efforts that had been made to make the city more adaptable had 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 worked. Um, so instead of the city uh, completely starting over with entirely a new form of transportation. It had adapted what was there originally, which I would say is a is a um, is the steps towards a more sustainable way of developing a city. Um, this is um, probably the next mayor of New York. I just put him in here because I, this is exactly um, this kind of hope of of the modern. I think is you know how he talked talked about in his campaign. This um, and this idea of taking that, uh, taking the 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 problems of the design design of the city and um, helping to adapt them for a new 
a new era. I think that's what we what the lesson that I take from the March 8th factory is that uh, that we can't this 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 the kind of destructiveness of trying to rebuild how um, how a people can be and how they uh, and build a space that creates how they can be that 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 we need an entirely different approach that we need to see how people learn from them how they could be adaptable and resilient um, in the face of that and think about how our cities can be more adaptive and resilient so instead of uh, starting from scratch every time and um, throwing out everything that was done previously uh, how can we adapt what we have um, be less wasteful live more in um, uh, uh, in a way that's going to be more friendly to the planet and is going to be more sustainable in terms of uh, in terms of human rights, in terms of people's lives, and that does not leave people abandoned um, by the wayside and and gives us a real uh, a new way of being modern that everyone can survive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Milo, for the, your talk, it covered a, a lot of um, ground in terms of going from looking at Hanoi, the history of modernization, to looking at a comparison of modern day New York and experiencing the same issues regarding um, resilience and needing to address the challenges that we will all be facing globally. So thank you very much for that. So I'd just uh, like to invite people if they would like in the chat, if you'd just like to um, if you have a question um, coming up from what Milo has said, um, just drop them into the chat and so that we can ask them um, as we go through and um, for our talk here. And then what I would like to do now is to also invite uh, Jennifer Vanderpool. So I will introduce her and drop into the chat any questions that you would like us to, for discussion at the end of our talk today. So now I would like to introduce uh, Jennifer Vanderpool, who's a social practice artist, writer and curator. And Jennifer um, it will talk about her exhibition Garment Girl, which opened at Heritage Space in Hanoi in May 2018 and was also exhibited in 2019 at the Quan Fong Gallery of Art and Culture in the California Lutheran University, Thousand Oaks. Um, so Garment Girl narrative has developed from um, Jennifer's immigrant grandmother's experiences, um, also um, working as a cook in a sweatshop in the Allegheny Ma Mountains, and her mother's stories about sewing shirt collars to pay for her college tuition. So um, Jennifer has interlaced her family, her matrilineal family stories of struggle and, and labour, um, also to investigate the global textile industry and in terms of garment workers sewing in sweatshops. So a Garment Girl exhibition is a multivocal narrative um, and using archival photography, prints, textiles and community collaborations. So Jennifer, I'd like to invite you now to take the stage and share about your work. Thank you. Share my screen. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. That's perfect. Thank you. Okay, so I am um, really excited to talk about uh, Garment Girl, and I thought I would start about why garment workers. So. Um, the idea of Garment Girl really began with stories my mother told about being a Garment Girl. Um, I should say my mother is Ukrainian and um, my mother's family um, were able to leave uh, the Ukraine. Um, my, um, both sides of the family, but my grandparents were um, children, obviously in, coming independently um, and arriving in Montreal. Um, they were not able to get into the United States um, at that time, but the Canadian government had a program to you know, help people leave um, Eastern Europe uh, in the 1930s. So um, the, my grandfather's family eventually moved to uh, 
the this small village outside of Pittsburgh. And of course, you know, my grandparents met. And um, so I, I grew up in this family of laborers and it was this sort of contradiction of coming from being a, a laboring class, but then having the ability to live a version of the American dream through education. And so, um, my grandfather and then my mother um, had the opportunity to go to very prestigious institutions, but the scholarships that um, my mother in particular received really didn't cover uh, all of her living expenses. And so she worked as a garment girl during the summers. And the uh, contract shop that she worked at was called Pramco, and it was a contract shop for Sears which is, if it's not defunct, nearly defunct um, old fashioned department st store here in the US. And my uh, grandmother and my great grandmother uh, worked you know, regular jobs in the shop there. My great grandmother was a cook and my grandmother was a sewist. And my mother um, to this day has you know, not a good sewer. And I think it's a, a stance against actually, actually doing that. But what her job was, was to push the shirt collars to the next sewist who would then attach a sleeve to the shirt collar. And the way the contract shops worked there, and as I just you know, discovered in Los Angeles and then talking with garment workers in Hanoi, is that the shops, um, the order is given from a department store and using this example, Sears, it is contracted out to contract shops, each shop uh, produces part of the garment, and then the parts are, you know, streamlined, and then the garment, the shirt, um, is sewn together. And the idea of working in a contract shop is that it prevents um, laborers from, you know, unionizing because they're not able to talk with each other. So there, there's not this sense of community. Um, many of the contract shops, people are paid piecemeal, so it means that they are paid the amount of garments that they are able to produce during a shift and a shift can last you know 12 to 18 hours to you know to actually not be able to leave where you're working um, and i started on this project when i was invited by kira ennis who was a director is still is a director of pisser college art galleries and this is 2010 11 right as i was finishing graduate school and this of course is you know, in the just the beginning of the aftermath of the Great Recession here and Southern California was hit particularly hard. Um, and so one of the things I really strive to do in my practice is to uh, do work that is community specific and site responsive. And in 2005, six, the city of Los Angeles put an, on in laws on the books, anti sweatshop laws. So what happened is of course, not all the sweatshops closed, but they moved to Orange County and Orange County had previous to this at that time and still does have sweatshops. And the, many of the workers in these Orange County sweatshops are Vietnamese refugees and immigrants. And so the images here on the left are from this work that I did at Pitzer College. And the clothing here was some of my clothing that I was recycling as art materials, but then gathered a lot of materials from Goodwill and other 501c3 thrift shop service stores. And what I learned from gathering this material is that when you donate your lightly used or some people donate heavily used things that you know really people cannot wear is that the goodwill stores and stores like this are graded one two and three so they go through the products that are donated and decide well this work this uh, material is high quality so we can sell it in the store this store in this community is a level two so we'll send goods there and then um things that can be cut up for rags you know are, are cut up as for rags and sold. And then a lot of the clothing is donated to um, emerging economies. So a lot of the goods coming from Southern California were actually sent to Central and South America um, as, as donated goods. So, you know, it's a little bit of an eye opener um, in making this work. And at this time, I was not doing uh, interviews and working with print imagery. I, I, you know, started out doing more traditional installation work and working with material and uh, 
you know, doing this type of work that really enveloped the viewer. There was audio in this piece, the sound of industrial sewing machines. So this is how I started interweaving my matrilineal family story. It's not really a prosthetic memory because it's not my narrative and my experience. I've never worked in a garment industry, but it takes that personal narrative and it gives me an entry point into the subject matter. Whoops. Okay, so this is Garment Girl. And when um, Heritage Space, Tuan, the director at Heritage Space, and I were communicating about me doing a project with them, one of the things that I had thought about was how do I create an exhibition that becomes more conversational and engages with a story that one um, responds to the communities that I'm that I live in, in Southern California, and as well as in Hanoi. And at this point, my work had changed quite a bit. Um, I, I, the mass of material that I think was pretty evident in the previous piece became so incredibly overwhelming for me that I really pulled back. And rather than working with materials in the physical sense, I started working with them in a digital sense and creating these layered images. So, with that in mind and trying to find a subject that I felt met this idea of being community responsive and multivocal, I thought about the interviews that I did with, you know, or the, I shouldn't say that, I should say that women that I met um, who were Vietnamese refugees and current Vietnamese immigrants in Orange County, as well as some other artists that I'd met who grew up in these communities. Uh, whose families and they themselves actually worked in the garment industry in Southern California. So um, the image that is on the left here is from um, a craftivism project that I organized with the help of Heritage Space um, with Pham Hong and this is her uh, sewing and she actually um, is a sewist. She went to college to learn how to be a tailor and then worked um, in the garment industry in Hanoi before being incredi incredibly um, overwhelmed by that experience and going out on her own and um, designing her own clothes and then selling them on Facebook. See, okay, so the kind of work that I do now is called social practice art. And it's a little bit of a different way of creating art because it's not about making a print or video or film or sculpture and installing them in the gallery. It's participatory and it involves people and communities in debate and it involves collaboration and social organization. And again, this image from the remake um, uh, craftivism project, which I will talk about later. Okay, so a craft, uh, social practice art um, is a form of activism and it helps communities work towards goals. It raises awareness, encourages conversation, um, improves living conditions and health conditions. Not that I would say every social practice art piece does that or that this piece did all of those things, but these are general characteristics of what social practice art is. So as I was, you know, postgraduate school really finding my voice as a cultural producer and thinking about the type of work that I wanted to make and the themes and subjects that I wanted to explore. It's the idea of how one creates a multivocal exhibition. And as I've talked about, I employ my family's uh, immigrant story. And I, I really have been focusing quite a bit on my mother's story. And I'm now getting to, you know, my dad's side of the story. My dad is from the Mediterranean, um, also an immigrant, um, but able to come to the United States a little bit later. So, so kind of starting to interweave these stories a little bit here. So I employ my family's narrative as um, a way to engage with um, issues of labor and social justice. And I want to knit these ideas together through allegorical imagery, through prints, 
through uh, on-camera interviews with workers and community activists and uh, academics. Um, and I want to think about the social construction of place based on the influence of history, of social class, gender, race, and, and labor. And so labor is the, the through here. So I often begin my projects in museums and working in institutional archives. Um, I, I tend to work with museums you know, for my exhibitions and, and, have, and really have had to learn how to adapt um, my practice for a, you know, a gallery uh, component to, to how my work functions. And that's been a little bit of a learning curve for me because I think about my, my work as being research-based, but the fact of the matter is, is that it's important to have gallery representation, you know, galleries or businesses, I need to be selling work, I need to be able to support myself. So, so taking themes from my more research-based practice and creating prints that expand on the theme and a little bit more of a general sensibility as opposed to being so research based. But for this work, um, I actually did a lot of archival work on my own and that can be anything from again working with museums and going through their collections and uh, selecting work from the uh, holdings of the institution to exhibit with work that I create, as well as, you know, uh, libraries and archives and then working with historic imagery um, in, in a kind of a, an analog way where I'm cutting out the components from this historic imagery and then collaging them um, in my new images. And so this can be from advertisements, magazines, film clips, other forms of material culture, um, and the material culture here can be anything from a uniform worn by a worker to gloves to these safety sorts of equipment. So I interpolate my own photographic imagery with this historic um, archival and you know, museum and, and looking at this in a very broad sense. And what's happened through this process is that I have created my own archive of imagery. So historical uh, visual culture and how can these historic imagery query, you know, raise questions about social labor, gender, race issues today. Um, and then I incorporate this historic imagery into my um, videos and on-camera interviews with workers. And then I also curate in these artifacts, paintings, material culture into my exhibition. So it creates this historic contemporary interweaving uh, visual narrative told through historic imagery, contemporary imagery that I've included using the historic work, as well as artifacts. And so the imagery we're looking at on the left um, from Garment Grill, these are prints, they measure 24 inches by 36 inches. The image on the right, um, the cover is from a wage record book. And these are books that women, predominantly women, um, you know, uh, in the 60s and 70s, uh, although earlier, both men and women working in sweatshops, mostly on the east coast of the United States. And in one of the um, interviews that I did with Dr. Richard Applebaum, who is a professor at UC Santa Barbara, he talks about how the garment industry moved from the east coast to the west coast uh, in the late 80s and into the 90s because of unionization in the US. And so then uh, the image is uh, this image here. So right in this image here on the left is actually from a textile industry in the south. And so what happens and what happened to Pramco, the contract shop where my grandmothers and my mother worked, um, it, there was an attempt to unionize it and uh, that failed and so then um, Pramco moved to Arkansas, which is a non-union state. Um, so anyhow, we'll go on to the next image. Oh, I'll figure this out. So I'm um, talking with workers as I was beginning to, you know, really, again, find my voice as a social practice artist, really um, made me think about how do I want to tell the stories in my work and how do I make them multivocal? And I'm not a documentary filmmaker. It's something that I explored doing and realized that I don't really have any interest in that. Um, I don't think that I have any particular 
ability at doing that. But the way that these on-camera interviews work is that you know, they become yet another element in my exhibition. So they are meant to then share stories in relationship to my imagery, in relationship to the archival material cultural work that I have in the exhibitions. And so it brings in these voices of, you know, who, how, how people in various disciplines in various careers approach similar themes. And so the um, image on top, these are the, the director and attorney for Blue Dragon, which is based in Hanoi. And um, they really focus on child labor and the idea of trafficking and redefining trafficking as, as not just young people trafficked from Vietnam to other countries, but trafficking within Vietnam. And one of the areas that they focus are child laborers. Um, and then the image on the left, um, the bottom, is a garment worker, Vietnamese refugee garment worker in Los Angeles. Um, and we'll see, hear her talk uh, in a few minutes. And then this is Hong, the woman I collaborated with on the um, remake workshop. And she is holding up a dress that she uh, designed and sells um, on her Facebook and her Facebook, and I'm sorry, I forgot to do this as, as we, this morning as we were, um, you know, starting the presentation, I realized, ah, I wanted to put this in, but you can find Hong's um, Facebook page. Her um, label is called Bananas and it is um, in Vietnamese. And I'm sorry, I will not try to pronounce that, but um, if you'd like to find that, that's where you can find that. Excuse me. A little bit of a summer cold. Okay, so this, uh, the images on the left here are installation images from Garment Girl. And again, this was in 2018 and um, then also went to the Quan Fong Gallery of Art and Culture at California Lutheran University. And the, sorry, the mission of the, of California Lutheran University, their art museum, is to really show socially engaged work and to focus on stories about California. So in other words, what happened with this project is that it became transnational, um, looking at LA as a, a smaller case study and then looking at Hanoi. So the documentaries actually changed between the two, um, venues because I was able to actually do some interviews in Hanoi and then you know re-edit the uh, on-camera interviews so while the imagery stayed the same the um, art you know community engagement work was specific to both communities and the documentary on-camera interviews which I need to remember just to call them that because it's not documentaries like you would think about uh, uh, seeing at a film festival or in a theater and they don't function that way, but, but somehow it becomes a way to explain what they are. Um, anyhow, they changed uh, at each location. So um, archival photographic interventions, textiles, on-camera interviews with sewists, activists, and academics, and then the remake Craftivism Collaboration in Hanoi and Swap Community Engagement in California. So this is the three panel mural and um, each uh, it, it measures together 60 inches by 108 inches. And when I create the archival photographic interventions, again, um, interweaving some of my imagery and historic imagery in the compositions, the idea is to think about portraying labor portraying third spaces or forms of entertainment and domesticity. So um, laborers work in homes, they have jobs. And then it's this question of, of what is leisure and where does one go for leisure? And I'm working with historic imagery here from the US and this imagery is before um, my great grandmother, my grandmother, and most certainly my mother worked in the textile industry. But when you work with archival industries uh, imagery, one of the things to consider is what is in the archive? 
who organized the archive? What is the mission of the archive? What is deemed important by the archive? Because it's going to influence what is collected. And then there's also the permission to use the imagery. So it's having a little bit of a trouble, you know, you getting, you know, permission to use some of this in, uh, imagery. So what I did is I went back very early. Um, and, and then as I'm the process of using these very early images discovered that a lot of the, you know, equipment and the way that people worked hadn't really changed. I mean, you know, when my, hearing my mother talk about, you know, her summer job working at Pramco is that it was women who were sewists. Um, it was a very, very dirty environment. Uh, my grandmother had scars on her hands from, you know, using these industrial sewing machines. But the people who were in positions of power were men and they really surveyed the women laborers. And my mother always, you know, had this fantasy about the beach as a teenager and a college student. Um, and it was one of these things that, you know, was a little bit unattainable. So it's this idea of imaginary realism, this idea of uh, leisure in this composition. And so uh, I'll show you here an excerpt of an interview. So the difficulty of switching mediums here. Okay, so this is an interview. Um, I know Viet Le, uh, we met um, working on a project, uh, you know, both invited to work on a project at the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam. And this is an interview with Viet and his mom. And it's a couple minutes long. Yeah, so I think they did um, kind of like more kind of skilled labor, and then of course me as a child labor. I think more kind of skill cutting. Sure. That's usually a woman more than men. Some about Latin, about 1819, 30 something. Many of you too. They get done by what they do. Come to the back, they get more money. So she said she has a friend, um, this is very recent, so I think so much of what I was doing, um, she just basically finishes, cuts the thread. But she only gets twenty dollars in a day. I think about eight hours something we got uh, uh she uh won't get that come here. Uh, it's a new word. <laughs> and she uh don't know English and she old and she don't know how to show but now she come back to Japan because she's just came back to Japan. Not every day. Uh, to help in fashion design. Uh, so, uh, can to business nhưng mà nhà đó thì mình cũng kiếm được một chút tiền à, mặc dầu cái à, số tiền mà họ trả rất là ít so với lại cái đồng lương nếu mà người ta làm ở ngoài <cười> so basically you have the option I think you can work in the factory or you um, they had uh, individual they need however many there's like stacks and stacks of clothes like here so they I don't know why you know, how's, how's that yeah. Uh, ở nhà có thể mình thiết kê tất cả mọi người cả nhà rồi những thì rảnh uh, mình có thể làm được 
mà không phải cái gì nữa thì đi tới cái chỗ là hành đó thì mình phải ngồi đó thì tất cả việc nhà mình phải để coi được đó. là gì vậy? Ừ. <cười> cái cái công trắc mà sớm thì họ công trắc với lại những cái 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 pháp môn cái gì cả nhà pháp môn à rồi họ mới thay vì họ kêu người bệnh thở để mà ngồi tại chỗ đó, thì nó quá nhiều thành ra có một số ở ở ngay ông trong khi này thì có một số họ nhận là mình tự ngay tại số mình lại hàng gì mình nhận mình là còn họ cũng có một số ngồi tại đó nhưng mà số ngồi tại đó nó khác còn số thì nhân viên họ làm And I think she did actually less than 10 years, maybe five. And then, as I recall, it was because we just moved here. And then, well, good thing. Never uh, mind, I know. Yeah, so she, yeah, I think it's because we were sitting on my father's house and um, we buy with my uncle. He doesn't like her anymore. But so I think to help with the payments. And yeah, I think that's when she started, or why she started. Usually. Um, they don't have any um, certificate and um, but uh, they come to the factory they uh, give the, uh, uh, the form that uh, they have some and <laughs> they have for <laughs> the contract uh, I I go to um, the, um, the shop, I think, uh, but the factory, they brought them. Yeah, uh -huh. uh, they cut already, but they still time to the other. The bundle, the, the bundle, bundle, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so um, we chose whatever, I think I can finish in time, so <laughs> they have a lot. And we have to sort them out. Like, so you come in and bundle, and then I take it out, and then I actually put it back in, and then you, there be like truck fulls or cars and stuff, and you have to drive it back. It's pretty heavy. By your okay, uh, how many pieces in a certain time frame? Um, the little pair of look one are yellow, okay, like a company. And the man, when the tower is between the and có khi uh, một trăm cái gam một cái trăm cái áo hay là cái dress gì đó là mình đem mai trong một tuần lại một trăm ngàn cái áo nó đạt cái dress như thế này so let's say a uh, hundred dresses in a week uh -huh. yeah I know it's more than that that's like mm -hmm. nhiều tấm nhiều chứ là từng cả ngàn chứ sao còn còn ngày không có là nhiều yeah so but you can decide how much you take in I remember there's like piles and piles of stuff. Yeah. She worked longer hours than she remember because I remember it's like all day. It's more than eight hours. Um, and then like when you had deadlines, it would be you'd stay up really late and then I'd have to like, you know, kind of you know, whatever. I should have read like uh, like 12 hour days or something, but always and it was just bulk, I think. I'm not sure if you remember correctly, but I think it was more it seemed to me to me more than 100 items in a week. It just seemed like hundreds actually. It's just like piles and piles. And then I think you would get um, be done with that batch, that quota, whatever, however many outfits, and then maybe you get a little bit of break, but maybe not. Like, I mean, you chose, but it just it seemed to be constant. And it's okay. Um, so this idea of, um, whoops, let me. <laughs> Let me get this figured out again here.
Okay. So another example of the um, use of different types of imagery, the laborer here, and the this is actually her union card, but um, it had some uh, information on the union card that I felt was going to um, be too personal. So what I collaged in here is actually a label from a US garment union and that it is um, to make sure that your garment has the US garment industry label on it. Um, these are strikers here and then this idea of leisure and the patterns that I used in the prints are actually printed as textiles in the exhibition. And these are patterns from my grandmother's clothes um, and my great grandmother's clothes who both you know, had fabulous clothes, which they did not purchase, they made, but in homage to you know, my own story um, or family story about that. And um, I'll show you this, and this is a little bit of a uh, shorter video um, uh, excerpt. And this is with a woman that um, I interviewed in uh, Hanoi. And it is about um, the situation of garment workers working in Hanoi um, right now. Program to work with them about domestic violence and uh, sexual harassment. Um, until now, so in Vietnam's law, uh, have a doc uh, definition sexual harassment. Also, in the labor law, um, have uh, some sentence talk about sexual harassment, but not definition. Yeah. So we would like uh, in the near future, uh, because of this time is the time processing to change something in labor law, editing, edit labor law. So we hope this issue can uh, change. And so one of the things that I learned working on this project and talking with the women workers and the activists and academics is um, about how laborers are treated and not only the um, dirty work environments and the lawn hours in the factories where the doors are locked and you know should there be a fire people can't leave and which should bring to mind the um, Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, um, you know, early 20th century, 1911, 1913, forgive me, I'm not quite ex exactly remember that year. Um, but, you know, these very dangerous work situations and issues of sexual harassment, um, in particular issues with women in uh, working in Vietnam who are coming from the countrysides um, and becoming the main fighting Busy fighters. day and night. Every eight hours, the shifts change. 15,000 men to the ship. I'm sorry, that just played automatically. I'm so sorry. I had everything queued up on Venmo and I apologize. Um, uh, the the um, working environments where in Hanoi, the laborers are coming from the countryside and the uh, women laborers are becoming the financial supporters of the families. And this is um, upending the gender roles of who is the financial supporter, but also having um, the responsibility of having to be a homemaker and a parent and a spouse and taking care of their parents as well. Um, and the stresses and strains on these women who um, are struggling to, you know, live uh, fulfilled lives, to 
you know, maintain all of these myriad of responsibilities and not having any sort of leisure time. The um, high level of alcoholism in um, the family units um, and then domestic violence. And so one of the things that I was not able to do that I wanted to do and I'm hoping to be able to do is to actually interview garment workers in Hanoi and um, Heritage Space was helping me set up these interviews. We spent a lot of time and months trying to get them organized and it looked like that that was going to be able to happen and then the um, uh, foreman in the plant kept you know decreasing and pinging what it is I could talk with them about. And as it turned out, what I was supposed to be able to talk to them about was not their work in the factory, but their lives and the um, situation of domestic violence in their households and how they were treated. And you know, through talking with the curator and staff at Heritage Space and some of the activists, you know, the, the woman that we just saw the clip from, from um, Seasaga and uh, Blue Dragon, as well as some of the academics from UC Riverside and UC Santa Barbara, who are labor scholars, um, Edna Bonasic and um, Richard Applebaum, uh, that, domestic violence would impact how the women were able to perform as workers. So it would become a subject that was okay for me to talk with the laborers about because it was something deemed bad for them, but also quite bad for the factories because it would prevent them from doing their work. So um, the images we're looking at right now are from the show. The image on the right is what a wage labor book looks like. And so you can see the women signing in and um, their, their numbers here. And it was a way to keep track of how they were paid. Um, and then a garment pattern on the left and cutting material. So these are the textiles. And again, um, you know, I attempting to choose patterns that one related to my personal narrative, but then taking this personal narrative from this exhibition and making it part of a public subject. And this is how they were hung. And they were quite, you know, 216 inches long and 42 inches in width. Um, and this is imagery from the Remake Craftivism Workshop. And this is something that Heritage Space uh, helped put uh, Hong and I together. And what we did is we fashioned a factory in the gallery space and we worked in the gallery space uh, and, the, and this remained part, you know, an element in the exhibition and was included in the final show and all of the participants came to the final show. Um, and so what we did is we fashioned a um, sweatshop in the gallery space and sweatshops like some still in Southern California, but also in Hanoi, um, especially where you find child laborers are actually in domestic settings. And so what is craftivism? Craftivism is a form of activism. It often has an anti-capitalist perspective. So this idea of working small, working by hand, it addresses environmentalism. It's a sense of solidarity and um, it often is focused on domestic arts. So this idea of third wave feminism is that um, it incorporates not just gender, but also looks at race and social class. And the images on the left, um, the sewist at the bottom, we made clothing from uh, recycled clothing. So we brought in all of us lightly used clothes and then um, Restitched, redesigned the clothes to give them an extended life. The image at the top um, is button covering. Um, and the way that Heritage Space, Hong, and I uh, advertised this opportunity, this collaboration, was through social media. And we invited anyone from the garment industry who wanted to work with us, as well as other artists who work with textiles or other artists who were interested in participating in the collaboration. Um, and we worked, you know, stitching, sewing, and we talked um, about, you know, the labor industry being a garment worker. And so the idea of the activism is 
in this sense, it's much smaller scale, so it can be more conversational and it can be centered on um, personal change or small community change. So um, Hong and I, as I just said, organized this. It was on social media and we were creating clothes from recycled ones. And one of the things that we talked about um, as we were making clothes is this idea of being a garment worker, of having a profession. And Hong shared her experiences of um, going to college and you know, studying to be a tailor, to be a designer, um, as she self identifies here as being a tailor, and this great resistance from her family because um, her dad had worked in the garment industry, the family really suffered financially, wasn't really able to support the family, so she and her brother worked um, doing homework, like we saw Viet in the earlier video talking about working with his mom um, in Orange, in Orange County. Um, so a similar sort of situation, and then also the responsibility of um, being a parent, of having domestic responsibilities, of taking care of your parents. Um, and this, and, then, and how does one create a sense of leisure? And so, you know, some of what we did was simple sort of things like sharing recipes or, you know, cleaning techniques or just actually being able to talk with each other and have a sense of, you know, conversation and collegiality. And this is from Heritage Space's Facebook page. And this is Tim, uh, Tu Kim Vu, um, who posted uh, about the workshop. And these are the bags that she made from um, the recycled materials uh, in the workshop. And then um, when the exhibition was in California, we did a free clothing swap. And the reason that Rachel Schmidt and I, Rachel is the director of the museum, had this idea of doing a free clothing swap is because the area around Thousand Oaks is very affluent, but there are, as in many big cities, especially you know, suburban sprawling sorts of cities like Los Angeles, there are low income people in this community. And there was a very, um, expansive low income uh, older adult community, as well as social service agencies and focusing specifically on children in foster care. And when a child turns 18, they age out of the foster care system. So they lose all of those basic sociological you know, needs like a place to live, something to eat, uh, clothing, uh, you know, and that basic structure of day to day life. So um, one of the things that we wanted to continue with this piece was the idea of, you know, recycling and upcycling clothing. So, you know, this, the, the amount of environmental resources that it takes to grow the cotton, 713 gallons per t-shirt or as much water as a person would drink in two and a half years. So the idea of, you know, trading lightly used clothing and making this event available to, anyone who could take public transportation. Um, it was free parking, it was free clothing. And we advertised both on social media, but as well as local newspapers, because we wanted to reach this older adult population. So um, I donated clothing, I collected clothing, as did Rachel and the museum staff. We invited people in the community to bring their clothing in and it was exchanged. Um, and then anything that was left over, we sorted through and donated to James Storehouse predominantly. And this is a 501c3, it's a nonprofit, so they get tax credit from that. Um, and it's based you know, to support uh, community welfare um, and child welfare. And I'll just show you here and hopefully Excuse I remember. Excuse me, Jennifer. Um, I just I wonder, do you have um, maybe take another minute or two just to um, complete what you would like to share with us and then so that we have some time for Q&A as well. I am, I'm wrapping up right now. Thank you, thank you. Sure, sorry, I know I'm talking a lot. Okay, so just really quickly, this is what the clothing swap looked like. And this gives you a sense of, you know, the different people who were there participating. Okay, so I'm done. 
sorry, I showed you a little bit more of the video with the uh, interview with Viet and his mom because I thought it might be of interest. So yeah, that, that was that was great. Thank you. And it's I think because the with the what we're doing with Hanoi ad hoc, we will be coming to that stage. So it gives a good idea of your social practice. And so it, it's really helpful as well as we continue with the research that we're doing here. So, um, so I'd like to really thank you both of our speakers for their really interesting talk and their sharing and all the, the perspectives that we're gaining on the people who bring the factories alive. You know, so their, how they it affects their domestic life and their how they kind of adapt to the circumstances that they find themselves in. So we've got some questions in the the chat. So um, the first one is from. Tien Tam, and it's saying thank you to Miller and Jennifer. Um, and it's a question about women in the workforce. So I feel these stories of women in factories, a great deal of their domestic lives is involved in how they work schedule and places are arranged. So what parallel or contradiction do you see between those stories and today's feminist movements in the workplace? And what can our today's world learn or unlearn from these past experiences and work life model, especially for women? Well, I guess I can just say very quickly that my project is very recent. And so some of what I've been dealing with, and I think it relates to, especially as we've seen in the pandemic, is women you know, who have careers are still responsible for child raising and domestic care. And it crosses uh, social classes and it crosses race. And if you are economically struggling, it makes it even more complicated. And, 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 and that's an ongoing issue, I think, through everything that we've talked about today. I think it might do you? Well, yeah, I, you know, I think that uh, I agree with, with, uh, with Jennifer and and also, if I may say, I think that this question and actually even a couple other questions in the chat have all within them a, a kind of a question that I get asked a lot. Um, and and it which is, um, are these are, are like, why do women take these jobs? Like, are these really the um, and one of the things that said in Vietnam, it, it was said to me many times is, well, wouldn't they rather wouldn't, wouldn't these women rather be uh, working in a factory than back in their in their uh, in their hometowns? You know, uh, working in the fields, um, being farmers. Like, isn't this a better? Isn't this a better life? Uh, um, more stable? But you know, just and so that's a and it's kind of a debate and it's a debate that's had all that's had all, all is had all over the developing world. Uh, about as uh, during periods of industrialization, as as workers move into working in factories, um, constantly, as if that was you know, and part of my point about sustainability is those those shouldn't be the only two choices, of um, working really hard and for subsistence in agriculture or working really hard for subsistence in industrial labor and and having the the kind of um, so, so I, so anyway, so I don't, I don't think there's really an answer to that, but I think that's kind of, that's sort of embedded in this question a little bit, which is, um, these, these jobs being really hard for women. Is it, is it a, a kind of feminist point for women to be able to, to do this sort of labor, um, and support their families, uh, or, or is that, or does it just further the oppression of women? Um, I think it's, so as I said, I, I don't have a question. I don't have an answer to that. They are really hard jobs. And I think um, Jennifer, I really appreciate your, you, you know, in your in the clip you had that you raised the issue around um, uh, domestic violence and sexual harassment in the factory. There are, um, and then there was a question also about the sort of uh, physical effects of working in the factories, um, women having permanent hearing loss. One of the things I saw in the factory in the March eighth was. Um, also a huge number of respiratory problems because the amount of fibers that were in the air from the, the spinning section, um, uh, you know, and, and, and um, women who, you know, whose hands were kind of, had just been uh, just hugely damaged by years of, of, uh, of sewing. Uh, so, um, 
it, so anyway, and 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 the the kind of vulnerability that women had um, certainly to sexual harassment, um, and and then I mentioned these shifts, these cra crazy shift changes, so that women's bodies were really disrupted because they would have. Um, they'd have some day shifts and then they'd be moved onto overnights and then afternoons and they were sleeping in different patterns and that. Um, and they weren't being able to predict when they could take care of their, their kids and how they could organize their family's lives. So all of those, um, all of those really are um, disruptive, incredibly disruptive. And, and are, I think are sort of implicated in this question of, uh, is, this a, is this a liberating experience for women? Thank you. And that kind of addresses because we had a question from Chum and talking about the hearing impairments and the other mm. kind of impacts yeah. of the environment. So I'll come to this. Um, yes. OK, so with Chum, I think we've addressed that. And this question here from. OK, so Jennifer, I am curious about craftivism. Why is it called domestic arts or like attributing crafts to the domestic sphere? Um, I think it's just how it's been defined. And I think maybe we could even say in third ways feminism, the idea of repurposing responsibilities um, of handwork associated, well, it's two things, domestic responsibilities associated with women's work historically and traditionally. Um, and the idea of repurposing this handwork as a form of activism and recontextualizing it through the communal uh, creation and the collaboration and discussions that happen as one is working with you know, fabric and sewing and that type of work. Thank you. And we have another question from Hong Ang Zhang. So how can we reduce the distances between women? So for example, between worker women, business vendor women and university graduated professional women. Well, I can say that um, I think that's very important. And that's one of the things that I'm trying to do with my work and um, through the on camera interviews is creating a platform for discussion and empowering people who whose stories are not often told who are not asked to share their stories or whose personal narrative is not valued as a form of knowledge and also through the community engagement and um, I think community engagement rather than out outreach is important because engagement then suggests the idea of conversation and thinking about um, how to meet the needs of the community and ask what the community needs and have it be more collaborative. Thank you. And uh, Mila, do you have any um, comment that you'd like to make around um, you know, spanning those distances between women well, it's interesting, uh, again, Jennifer said kind of um, one of the things that I was thinking, which is um, which is the same feeling that I had about the research that I did, which was that these um, women's lives that were, you know, weren't, they weren't, they weren't documented. They kind of, they sort of weren't, um, they were, they were idealized as part of a socialist history, the idea of what, of, of what a factory, a woman factory worker, or March 8th factory worker was, but that real experience, that lived experience that they had, um, those stories hadn't really been told. And I think, um, to me that, uh, spending that, that time with them and I was, you know, with them for almost two years that I was doing that research, I was working in the factory and being in the factory dormitory with them and, um, uh, really wanting to honor the um, their experiences and and um, to me that was a that was a first step in in spanning those distances and thinking about the the dignity of work um, for you know every everyone who does it in all forms. Good, thank you. Yeah, very good points to make. So, uh, if there's any more questions from the audience, please um, share them. I was also interested too in terms of. Um, your 
research, if um, there's further places that we can look at to look more at your research, Mila, and also Jennifer, if um, people, I think you have a website as well. So just if, if you wouldn't mind sharing in the chat, if you have a place where people can like look further into your research and what you've been doing, that would be great. Um, and the Hanoi Ad Hoc has a question. So Mila, you insisted a lot in your presentation on the role that the March 8 factory played in producing and engineering a good socialist worker woman. And you explained how the collective housing quarters were designed to foster socialist values. Are there ways in which the physical form or design of the factory was put to use for that purpose also? Um, it's a it's a good question. You know, a lot of what um, what I saw in the in the factory and what people talked about in, in terms of how the factory created the socialist worker was about this kind of political education and the meetings and the excitement. I talked about <clears throat> the the posters. So they weren't necessarily things those weren't all necessarily things that were physically built into the design of the factory. One thing that was physical, I think I mentioned this in passing, was about the wall altars, you know, that about putting up, um, that that was something that by the time I did my research, every section in the factories had its own altar um, and uh, and talked, talk, uh, and that was something that, you know, was was taken for granted and that women talked about the, the importance of kind of, um, a, a, a the spirits in taking care of them, keeping them safe, you know, um, making them productive, and that, uh, but that in their histories talking about that was something that was really, really hard for women originally when they came from the countryside was that the fact that they there weren't altars in the anywhere in the factory, mm -hmm. and so that was a uh, that was something that was physical that was really manifest manifest, mm -hmm. um, and and another thing sort of also related to the campaign against superstition and, and um, uh, any ideas of, a, of, a, of, a, of spiritual influence in the world was about geomancy, about the principles on which the factory was built. So that was one thing that people, all, women were also concerned about was you know the direction that certain building, the parts of the buildings faced and the machines in them. And there was a lot of, it was kind of a lot of conversation about the orientation, which is you know a sort of fundamental idea of feeling, feeling safe and and comfortable in your in your environment is to know that that um, that's been taken into account and so the fact that that wasn't part of the planning for the factory and that women felt like that was it was badly designed for that reason but it was deliberate to to demonstrate um that 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 that, that kind of old superstitious practice didn't have any meaning and and in the modern socialist worker um work you know that wasn't that wasn't that wasn't a relevant value for them so i think that those sort of it was almost in in what was what was not there that uh that 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 those ideas were expressed okay so kind of the the absence of that um <clears throat> socio-cultural kind of um norms that they were familiar with yeah okay thank you very much that's very very interesting to hear can i ask so, a quick can i ask a quick follow-up question verbally <laughs> um my lad the um eight of march factory they did have um communal uh services they did have a kindergarten they did have a, a primary school or a health clinic and if so was it next to the collective housing quarter was it with the hutepte because they were not in the same compound if i remember well right the factory and the hutepte were not in this within the same uh, exactly mm -hmm. on the same site. So if there were uh, facilities, collective facilities, where, where were they? Were they attached to the housing or attached to the uh, factory itself? They were mostly attached to the factory itself. So that was um, that was another way in which the factory was creating a kind of entire environment. And actually, um, uh, it's 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 a it, kind of important point that the there were there was that level of involvement in women's lives, which which most for the most part was no longer true by the time I did my research. But again, during that period of high socialism was this idea that, yeah, that the, the kids of the factory were the of the factory workers were raised in these um, uh, in these kind of um, daycare centers were actually because of those shifting those shifting times, there were there were periods of time when women just didn't see their kids all week where they were just taken care of constantly. And they might stop in and visit them when they had breaks in their shifts, but then we just see them, you know, on their 
on their days off. Um, they had, the clinics were there. It was a lot of patrolling of women's um, uh, sexual and reproductive functions. You know, there was there was uh, there was that was part of the constant campaign about using birth control, um, uh, basically telling women when they got pregnant that they needed to have abortions if they didn't have if they hadn't spaced out their the time the birth of their children, um, and and making sure that that happened. So there was a lot of there was a lot of um, uh, the involvement of the factory and the personal lives and bodies of the women. So just uh, any further questions? Um, otherwise, um, I would really like to express a very grateful thank you um, to both of our speakers today, for Jennifer Vanderpool and for Mila Rosenthal. Really appreciate um, all the information that you've um, shared with us so generously, and it's given us a really fabulous insight into the lives of the female factory workers in Hanoi at this period in time and has raised a lot of very interesting questions for how we move forward and what the examples that we can take from this in terms of looking at to the the hopes for modernism yet again as we move forward into the future for cities and how we design them for people so thank you so if you'd like to join me all in giving a, a thank you to our speakers please <laughs>